my favorite thing about working in healthcare is the people. This industry brings together brilliant, highly motivated individuals who are driven by the opportunity to make a difference. My name is Hallie Tecco, and this is The Heart of Healthcare, a podcast where I'll be introducing you to the people on the ground moving the needle in public health and medicine. yourself from negativity and that's what stops most people negative thoughts you can coat your mind from negativity it's a real simple exercise to do I do it every morning before I walk out the door so I walk out as a positive person Every day, we're bombarded with the pressure to be positive. From good vibes only shirts, to life is good bumper stickers, to the advice, look on the bright side, we're constantly told that the key to happiness is silencing negativity whenever it crops up. Even when faced with illness, loss, and other difficult challenges, there's little space for talking about our real feelings and processing them so that we can feel better and move forward. If all this positivity is the answer, why are so many of us anxious, depressed, and burnt out? In her newest book, Toxic Positivity, sought-after therapist Whitney Goodman shares the latest research, along with everyday examples and stories that reveal how damaging toxic positivity is to ourselves and our relationships. Whitney Goodman is a psychotherapist and owner of the Collaborative Counseling Center, where she helps people improve their relationships and emotional awareness. She is committed to making mental health information accessible and easy to understand, which she does primarily through her popular Instagram account, at sitwithwit. Whitney, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Okay, so what is toxic positivity, and when did you first really notice it happening around you? Toxic positivity is this unrelenting pressure to be happy, be pursuing positivity at all costs, no matter what the circumstances are. And it's something that we use against other people and and also against ourselves. I think this is something that I've noticed was around me for a long time, but I didn't really have a name for it. And I started noticing it mainly on Instagram. When I got on there to market my practice, I was seeing all these posts that like, you know, just be happy, just smile. You're only one positive thought away from a good day. And I started talking about it with my clients and friends and family. And I noticed like, wow, this is a thing that a lot of people are noticing. It's not just me. Yeah. And who came up with the term toxic positivity? So I have not been able to pin that down. I know I used it in an (laughs) Instagram post. Yes, I haven't found it anywhere else. Um, But, you know, I hate to claim it if it wasn't me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, well, let's, you you mentioned these mantras that you've seen online, that we've all seen online. I want to play just to kind of make sure that the listeners understand what we're talking about. We're going to play a little game. I'm going to say one of these barf inducing mantra. <laughs> and if you could just give us like a line or two about why it's problematic. Okay. Sure. Positive vibes only. Okay. So it is impossible to be positive all the time. It's actually not useful or helpful either. So I think when we're kind of reducing people to only having a positive experience, we're putting a lot of pressure on them and missing out on a lot of good information and experiences. It also has to be fake at some point. You can't exactly you literally can't keep that up. Uh- <laughs> totally unsustainable. Okay. Look at the bright side or look at the silver lining. (laughs) So this one I think is the core of toxic positivity is like you're offering someone a very simple solution 
for a very complicated problem. So when you mm. say this to someone who's depressed, going through a hard time, it just, it sounds so simple, but it's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's kind of like I've dealt with infertility and I'm dealing with infertility. And it's kind of like people saying, just relax, it'll happen. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. When you least expect it, it'll happen. It's like literally yeah. I spent tens of thousands of dollars poking and prodding and every professional doctor can't fix me. Relaxing <laughs> is not going to fix me. Exactly. Exactly. Which is kind of similar to this one, but it is kind of, it's like this, it could be worse, which I think we all grew up at the dinner table where parents saying like, you need to eat this because there are starving children elsewhere. Yes. What about that one? Yeah, that was a huge part of my dinner table experience. You know, I think it's weird that we say this to people that are anxious or going through something hard. Like that's just going to make you feel worse. It could always be worse, but I don't find any way that that's particularly helpful when people are Mm -hmm. struggling. Not for me, at least. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And then the last one, whew. Just keep swimming. Never give up. (laughs) Yes. This isn't very popular advice, but sometimes it is okay to give up or maybe even optimal to give up. And I think we live in this culture where it's like you should always keep trying and pushing and doing more. And that's why people burn out or they end up doing things they don't like or that aren't good for them. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I think we have to realize that. I heard this somewhere. I can't remember where, but it was powering through is not a requirement for being powerful. Mm, right? I like so that. It's like, yeah. it's like you like sometimes deciding that giving up is the best option. You're in a miserable job. You've tried everything to get pregnant and you're not, and you just want to go back to enjoying your life. There are things that we feel like hearing never give up and being told that your whole life, you know, you don't realize how freeing it can be to give up sometimes. Absolutely. Or when it can kind of like to put a positive spin on it, bring you to something that maybe is actually better in some circumstances Mm. for you. You know, of course, there's a lot of nuance to this topic. Yeah, certainly. Okay. So what is the shame cycle that's built into toxic positivity that we've all been victim to? (laughs) What I found is that toxic positivity really tells us that I should be feeling this certain emotion. I should be happy. I should be grateful. And when people say that to themselves or have someone else say it to them, there's this huge gap between what they're actually feeling and what they're being told they should feel. And that's where the shame really starts to bubble up and and be experienced, I think, in that gap. And we're like, okay, what's wrong with me? Why Mm. can't I feel what other people are feeling or what I'm supposed to feel. Mm. Could it make someone who's prone to depression and anxiety even worse to be around that mentality? Absolutely. Because you're already feeling isolated and othered and um, incapable maybe in some ways that I think when you just add another layer onto that, it's debilitating. So We don't want to perpetuate toxic positivity, but we also, no one wants to be labeled as like the negative Nancy. You know, we all know someone who's that complainer and don't necessarily want to be the complainer. So what is the secret to complaining effectively? So you're not, we, we know that it's impossible to be happy all the time, that it's toxic to be happy all the time when it's inauthentic, but on the other end of things people who have pent up grief and frustrations and complaints, how do you air those without being the negative Nancy? Yeah. So I have a theory that the people that really complain the most are the ones that just haven't been heard or they're in, they're complaining ineffectively. So the way to complain well is to really identify what is the problem? What are you upset about? What's the issue? Then thinking about what do I want the result? to be? What do I want to happen here? Which might just be that you want to feel heard or that you want to feel understood. And then really focusing on who or what can make this happen for me. So we often go to the wrong people. Like if you're complaining about your food at a restaurant to your friend and you don't tell the waiter, you're probably not going to get your needs met. And really getting clear on like, what is it going to take to get me where I want to be with this issue? Mm. So at work, I I read in a business book 
that you're not supposed to complain to someone who can't fix it. Otherwise, it's just gossiping. Mm. Is that true? You know, I think it depends on the issue, right? If you are talking about something that's going on in the workplace to a coworker and really your goal is just to be validated, to have them tell you like, oh, that makes sense. I think you should go to someone and talk about that. Okay, Mm -hmm. fine. But if it's a legit, you know, a problem about scheduling or the way work's being doled out and you're trying to do something about it, it definitely makes sense to go to the right source. Yeah. So what if you're the person that someone is going to, to complain. I feel like there are certain types of people who are just like magnets for the complainers um, are like, and you don't really think that their complaint merits validating. What's the best way to handle that? I think you have to learn to set boundaries. So Mm. if someone is continuing to come to you and you're just getting nowhere and it feels like it's draining you, it's okay to say, I can tell you're really struggling with this. Like, I wish I could be helpful to you, but I don't think I'm the right person to help you with this issue. Mm -hmm. And even telling them like, I think so-and-so might be better or have you thought about doing this can sometimes be a good way to like show empathy, but also get it off of your plate. Yeah. And once you say that once, they're probably not going to come back. Yeah, (laughs) You didn't fill their cup, so (laughs) they're going to go elsewhere. Exactly. Tell me about how the way we talk about illness, which you say in your book is loaded with toxic positivity. Yeah. So this was the first place I really discovered uh, toxic positivity. And there's been a lot of literature on this that we describe people as either healthy or sick. They've won the battle or they lost the battle, you know, especially when we think about the language around cancer, right? It's very positive, very upbeat, lots of like ribbons and balloons. And I work with a lot of young people, especially who have chronic health issues. And I've noticed that people don't really have the language to talk to these people because they're kind of in this space where they're always going to be living with these illnesses. It's not because they're weak or they're not positive or they lost the battle. It's just like, that's what's going on. There's no cure right now. And they're living with an illness or a disability. And we have to kind of change our language around that, I think, to be a little bit more inclusive. Yeah. There's also a lot of language that sounds like wartime language using like the word warrior and survivor. Totally. And there's this sense that if you didn't beat the illness, if you didn't win the battle, like you're saying Mm. that you somehow lost. A lot of times I think it's attributed to the fact that you didn't try hard enough. Maybe they weren't positive enough. Like when people overcome illness, I find that there's this huge emphasis put on their mindset when really it was multifactorial and it was probably, you know, their mindset, but also the doctors they had and the treatment and their unique genetics Mm. that all helped them get to this place and just luck sometimes. Yeah. And to deal with the mental load of facing a tough diagnosis and being put in the position where you're expected to quote unquote fight and be a fighter when in reality, sometimes you just want to go lay in bed and cry. Yes. I mean, you brought up infertility. I think that that's one of those situations where there's so much pressure on you already when you are going, having something medically going on to fix it, to research all this, that the last thing people need is this extra pressure of like, you better do all of that with Mm. a smile and happy and positive so that it's like more palatable for everybody else to deal with. Yeah. Well, one of the biggest issues we have in the infertility community, which I'm deep, deeply (laughs) part of, is that We hear most from people who end up with the family that they envisioned. We hear from the women who went through IVF. It was a difficult time for them. But at the end of the day, they have their two children, two years apart, boy and girl. And that's exactly what they wanted. And they got what they wanted. And they say things like, hashtag worth the wait Mm. or never give up. And you see that. But who we don't hear from are from the women who didn't get the results they wanted. And the fact is under a third of women going through IVF in one round will have a baby at the end of it. So the the data is not on your side. Like most women aren't getting what they want, yet we hear more from those who end up with the baby. They're the loudest. They're the proudest. They're the happiest because it worked for them. 
Yeah, that's so true. And it's so easy to prescribe a positive attitude or optimism from the other side when you got what you want, right? Yeah. It's it's much harder to do that when things yes. didn't go the way you expected. Yeah. I find it helpful to follow there is a childless not by choice community. And I think it's important that they continue to use the infertility TTC journey hashtags because I think it's important for women kind of in the beginning of their infertility journey to see that not everyone ends up with the family that they wanted. Let's set up realistic expectations for infertility outcomes. So true. Okay. So you've advocated for an expanded definition of well-being. Can you share more about that? Yeah. I want us to start thinking about well-being in the sense of everything that makes us whole as human beings. So I think we think a lot just about physical health. Now we're starting to talk more about mental health, but really thinking about our relationships, what we have access to, you know, our resources, the privileges that we have, and then also our mental well-being, our physical well-being, the environment around us. I think there's so many pieces that we're not talking about that have such a massive impact on us and our overall health. And over the last two years, I feel like everybody's well-being has just gone down the drain. Yes, unfortunately like, so. Right? I mean, so like our, our social and emotional health, being isolated, living in fear, watching friends and family members get sick. It's so true. I think we've been inundated with information over the last two years, so many different things to be afraid of, feeling isolated, like you mentioned, that it's hard to get back to the basics sometimes of like, all right, what do I really need to make myself feel good so that I can live the life that I want? Which sometimes is beyond what you think of as self-care, right? Like you think of self-care as like a bubble bath (laughs) and a glass of wine, but really finding that it might be just having those deeper connections, being intellectually engaged at work, reading a good book, things that bring you inner peace. Exactly. I think we get, we've really commodified self-care, right? Like it's all these things that you need to buy and do and skincare, blah, 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 that it's a lot about just like, getting back to the basics. Are you drinking water? Are you sleeping? Like, is your neighborhood safe? You know, these big Mm. things that have such a big impact on our overall health. So you work with patients day in, day out that are facing pretty heavy things in their life. I imagine just that the emotional weight that you carry with you at work is like most people in your profession, pretty difficult. How do you, how do you unwind from that? How do you fill your cup after a really hard emotional day of labor? So for me, structuring my time in a certain way and having non-negotiables scheduled on my calendar has become so important Mm -hmm. that I make sure that the first part of my day, you know, I'm moving my body in some way, I'm getting water, I'm eating something before I even get to my work. And I've learned that setting myself up for success in that way makes it so that I can get through my workday without feeling like resentful or depleted or like I don't Mm. have time for myself. And that's been the biggest change I've made over the last two years. So you don't roll over in bed when you wake up and first thing you do, look at your phone. (laughs) That is a new habit that I have been working on actually over the last like month because I was doing that every morning and it was slowly killing me. Yeah. I, I, I'm guilty of that. I'd like to, um, I'd like to have conviction to change that, but I'm (laughs) always like, okay, what did the West coast send me last night? Now that I'm working East coast hours, um, what do I need to catch up on? But I do think that there's value in kind of setting your day without work, setting your day for yourself. And if you set those intentions in the morning of like, okay, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to have my breakfast. I'm going to not think about work before opening up that, you know, my email and Slack (laughs) and whatnot could probably be a good thing for all of us. We'll be right back after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? 
Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. So we can't assume happiness causes good health, but we know there's a relationship between optimism and better health outcomes. Can you share more about this? You share this a little bit in your book. Yes. So when people are optimistic, they are more likely to engage in health enhancing practices, which we know can be very helpful for physical health and mental health outcomes. So if you are optimistic, if you have you know, a solid mindset of like, I have some control over my life, you're probably going to do things for yourself that will improve your health, like exercise, take your medication, things like that. Oh, so interesting. Yeah. So the reason that's really interesting because the reason I got into healthcare was a little bit random. So I was in college and I was studying, I minored in Italian okay. and our teacher offered us extra credit to go teach basic Italian to cancer patients at the Cleveland Clinic. And it was a trial that was looking at does language learning and thinking about like a future vacation improve outcomes in any way? Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. And so that kind of got me hooked. I was, it was interesting to me to think about healthcare beyond just what we can do in the medical setting, but are there levers that we can pull in people's lives to help them live healthier, happier lives and have better outcomes? Yeah. What you're saying, that study is, is reminding me of something else I included in the book about like positive fantasies that a researcher showed that people who are going through like war, really difficult times, fantasizing about something in the future, like a vacation or getting out of a certain place can be really powerful to help you get through that time. It doesn't necessarily make your physical health better or anything like that. But it's a really powerful way to help people kind of say, I'm going to get through this and get to the other side. That's been a powerful tool for me. We had our 10th miscarriage in February and we our due date was this summer. My husband and I decided after that we were devastated um, wow. and decided yeah. that well, we won't be changing diapers this summer. Let's do something epic. We've been cooped up in our house for mm-hmm. so long. So we're planning an epic vacation. And it has been really good for my mental health. I think I can focus on something good and positive in the future that I'm looking forward to. It's definitely helpful. It doesn't replace grief. It's just, <laughs> you know, in addition to working through grief, you can find things that get you excited about the future. That's, I think, the key to healthy positivity, right? Is being able to say, like, we've gone through this really difficult thing. I'm grieving and I have this in my life. And they both Mm -hmm. can coexist at the same time. So the body positivity movement has really taken off over the last couple of years, which kind of at surface level seems like a great message. It's all about self-love and being proud of the body that you're in. But you actually advocate for something called body neutrality, which since learning about it from you sounds even more compelling. Tell us about what this is and how it's different from body positivity. You know, it's so unfortunate because I think body positivity was started by activists, you know, people of color that really wanted to uh, make space for different types of bodies. And unfortunately, it got kind of taken in the same direction as positivity. And now it's this whole, like, you have to love your body. You have to be obsessed with your body. And I find that it's not accessible for most people. So body neutrality is really this idea that it's just like, I have a body this is my body. And I don't really have to think about it so much. Like it can just be my body. I want it to feel good some days, other days it might be harder to be in it, but we're taking the obsession away a little bit from how we're so fixated on the body. But how can we not be fixated on the body when that's all that's on social media is people posting pictures of themselves looking amazing? It's really hard and and something that I've struggled with personally. And I think you have to learn how to speak to yourself with neutral language. 
of almost just like, this is what my body is like today. And now I'm going to go live my life and I can Mm. do things to enhance my health in a way that have nothing to do with changing my physical body as like the priority. So Mm -hmm. I can walk, I can exercise and trying to tap into what are the other benefits of that? What else does it do for me that is going to keep me engaged? Because there's this message of sort of like hating your body into health and it's just not possible. Like you're not going to get healthy through those mechanisms. Yeah. So what about an experience like pregnancy where your body is changing so much, but all we see are these gorgeous, you know, Rihanna pregnant and um, Beyonce pregnant, who they look so amazing. Um, What does that do for women who are pregnant and actually hating the way they feel? Yeah. You know, it's so tough. I am nine months postpartum. And I think that for me was a huge struggle of like this feeling of you're supposed to just bounce back and Mm -hmm. look the same. And, And you see people, you know, posed in certain ways and wearing certain things that, I think the pressure is huge and you almost have to opt out. Like, I'm not going to follow these people. I'm not going to bombard Mm. my brain with these messages because we can't filter them out effectively. I found for me, it was like I had to just cut out the noise. And then on on the flip side, what can we do as people who, and hopefully now listeners that understand what toxic positivity is, what can we do to put out messages on social media that are healthy and not harmful to people? How can we not add to all the toxic messages that are already out there? I think we just need to be honest and like keep nuance alive online. So, you know, not offering people simple solutions for problems that we know, maybe know nothing about, Mm. um, being honest about things to the degree that which you're comfortable, but I find people are just outright lying, you know, about Mm. how they achieved things, what their body's like, what they feel like online that it's like, you know, tell some of the story, be honest with people about like, I had help. I didn't do this all on my own. And and I think we just need to bring the humanity back a little bit and step away from the perfection. So on perfection, what do you think about filters and all the crazy filters that are available now? Oh my gosh. I try to not use them at all because I think they mess with people's brains. I I'm so Mm -hmm. interested to see what research is going to come out on this later, but if I view someone with a filter a lot, I start thinking that's really what they look like. Um, and so consciously reminding yourself, you know, looking up in that little corner, like it says they have a filter on. And even if they don't, if it looks like their features are all blurry, they probably yeah. are using a filter. Yeah. Well, I feel like I've I've catfished all of my new colleagues. So our, our my company was acquired in October, and we haven't I haven't met my new colleagues from the from the new company um, in person. And all they know is like my my headshot, right? So <laughs> on on Slack, it's my headshot. My headshot's like my best day, right? It's not filtered, right. but it's filtered. I mean, I have makeup <laughs> on, my hair is done, and then I like see them on Zoom, and I just think I feel like I'm I'm catfishing them because my picture, so my funny. headshot is like so much more polished than the way I I look on a day-to-day basis, which is why I do an audio only podcast because I don't want to have to like think about how I look. It's so true. And even on Zoom now, I use that. There's a filter on Zoom that will like make you look better. (laughs) Oh yeah, I've seen that, but it doesn't. The one on, there's one on, um, yeah, Zoom has it. There's another one that I saw that like will put makeup on you. Oh wow. I got an ad for it and it'll, it'll, yeah, it like changes the way. It's like a filter on Instagram. It changes the way you That's look next on. level. We got to draw the line somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I just don't want to be on Zoom. Sometimes I just want to be audio only in these meetings because mm-hmm. I just went for a run or I, I actually don't run, but I just went for a walk or I just <laughs> went, you know, I, I you know, I just don't feel like being seen. And I feel like that's uh, for sure you know, during the pandemic that that need to just not look at yourself. <laughs> We've never spent so much time looking at ourselves than over yep. the last two years. So true. So what are some do's and don'ts for talking to a friend or a family member who is dealing with something difficult and you want to be helpful and not harmful to their their grief process? There are two things I think everyone should try to do. The first one is 
seek understanding. If this is somebody that you're close with, asking questions, what's the hardest part for you? Like, what do you think you're struggling with? What do you wish was different about this? Really getting to know what they're going through. People like to talk about their experiences a lot and it makes them feel safe and heard. And then from there, trying to validate their experience. Like that sounds really hard. That makes sense. I get why you would feel that way in this situation, like trying to be with them. And from there, asking them, like, what do you need? Do you want me to sit with you? Like, do you want advice? Do you just want to vent? Not being afraid to ask people like what you can do for them is so important because then we don't have to guess or mess up. And so before chiming in with your similar, but nothing at all similar (laughs) experience, (laughs) you should ask, do you want like, how can I help? Is there, can I tell you my story? Are you supposed to ask and opt in, have them opt into that? I think so. Because, you know, unless you really know that you know exactly how this person feels and what they're going through, it's, it can be kind of dicey. Like I'm sure you've had people, you know, through your own fertility journey kind of say like, Oh, I know what that feels like because I went through X and it's like so off base. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean, I've definitely experienced that. You're like, that's not at all the same. Yeah. So like just treading carefully, I think in giving those examples until you really have a good sense is what I would recommend. Yeah. The one that drives me crazy the most is, and I feel like maybe it's an older generation thing, but saying like, you know, the universe works out as it should, or like what was meant to be will be. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like that's a comment, something I, I hear from older family members or friends who might have grown up just hearing that constantly, like things are supposed to be the way they are. Yeah. And that of course depends on your belief system. Those really like make me very upset because I think you're saying to someone who had a certain outcome in mind, that's probably quite important to them that like, this was the way it was supposed to go. And you're almost Mm -hmm. telling people like you went through that pain because it had to happen. It was supposed to happen. And I don't find that to always be helpful. Yeah. It's like a worldview. Like you deserved what happened to you. Exactly. Yeah. That's not helpful at all. Whitney, thank you so much for your insights today. Thank you so much for having me. You can follow Whitney on Instagram at sitwithwit, and you can find her new book, Toxic Positivity, at your local bookstore. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Heart of Healthcare. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. The Heart of Healthcare is a product of Offscript Health. We are a healthcare engagement company built for patients and caregivers by patients and caregivers. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our senior producer is Brianna Seely. Our intern is Antonella Sterniolo. Our host is Hallie Tecco. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Brianna Seely. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscriptnot.com. That's media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscript.com.